Hello, everybody, and welcome to our GIS lab and wildlife analysis. This is one I really like, so I'm excited to share it with you. It's uh, it, you know, I'm a wildlife biologist myself, and so this this kind of comes near to my heart. Now, in this lab, we're going to do three basic types of analyses. We're going to look at environmental envelopes, minimum convex polygons, and kernel densities. Uh, just as a heads up for the lab, uh, this lab will be done as crews, so each crew will turn in a single document. Uh, everyone in the crew should do all the methods. And, uh, the, the labs have you do uh, each method a few different times, so make sure that each crew member gets experience at each one of them. We've ha found in the past that uh, previous uh, classes have tried to split up this lab assignment where one person does all the environmental envelopes, one does all the minimum convex polygons, and another one does all the kernel densities. But uh, heads up, kernel density is the real-time consumer here. This is the hard one that takes all the work. So if you allocate your lab assign assignments like that, your person doing kernel densities is going to be sad. So And, and y'all would miss out on the chance to do all of them. So. Now make sure everybody gets a chance to do each one. Uh, this lab will be due in a week, midnight uh, next Monday. So uh, go ahead and if you can get it in early, I will try and grade it and get it back to you so you can repair any mistakes that you might have made. Okay, now, um, so actually each of these methods, environmental envelopes, the minimum convex polygons, and the kernel densities, these are all good, solid methods for wildlife analysis. Most wildlife biologists use them. Uh, most of us actually go a step or two beyond what you're going to do in this lab, but uh, this lab will show you the basics, and, and once you got this down, then it becomes a lot more fun to try variations on the methods. So first off, environmental envelopes. These are a landscape level approach where we're identifying where an entire species prefers um, based on uh, based on habitat preferences the species has and based on where the that habitat exists on the landscape. So this method has a fancy name, environmental envelopes, but it's actually a very simple and intuitive method. And in fact, if if you had the job of inventing a method to identify where an animal prefers, you know, this is probably the first one you think of. It, it's that clear. And look at this example. We have all these animal locations distributed across the San Francisco peaks. Suppose we're just looking at two habitat characteristics, slope and elevation. Well, from all those locations, we can get the slope and elevation at each point. We can graph these out on a little chart here. So we, you know, we see the spatial distribution of point uh, elevation and slope. An environmental envelope is just taking the range of values amongst each variable. So in this case, we have an elevation of all those points. We have elevations ranging from 2,600 to about 3,700 meters. We have slope values ranging from a little over 5 degrees up to just under 40 degrees. So we, we, we take the range of these, and then we plot the, make that into a box in the graph, and the environmental envelope is just all those points on the landscape that lay within this box. So when you look at it on the map, we can classify every point on the landscape that lies within the minimum and maximum elevation and the minimum and maximum slope. And it has to lie between both of those ranges at the same time, and this is what you get. So it, it's a very simple method, I mean, obvious even. Um, I guess a few downsides to it are that it may be a little too obvious and too simple. If you go back to this slide here, I mean, you, you can see in this slide that the, the, the points are really s distributed sort of in a diagonal. You get very few regions that have a very low elevation and a very high slope. The animal is never located there. You also never see the animal in a place that has a high elevation and low slope. So these regions, these triangular corners, are are classified as a habitat, even though the animal clearly never goes there. So this is kind of a downside. It, it it's a little uh, too simplified. Uh, and as with any habitat analysis, if you know, it's also dependent on whether you got the right data sets, uh, the right variables you're measuring. 
In this case, we're just using slope and elevation, but you know, maybe if you look at this map, it looks like maybe there's something going on with aspect too. You see this animal distributed along the north, uh, west, and south slopes of the peaks, but never seems to be facing the east. So maybe there's something about aspect or maybe solar uh, location that is driving this distribution. So uh, the solution here would maybe to incorporate aspect into the environmental envelope. Uh, that, that might work. One way that people take this a step farther, and we're not going to do this in the lab, is to do a more statistical approach, such as calculating this Mahalanobis distance on the landscape. This is also just based on slope and elevation. But instead of just giving you a true or false response, you know, is the landscape within those ranges or not, this, this method calculates the similarity of the any point on the landscape to the average slope and elevation observed for all of these animals. So if, if, uh, if the average slope and elevation is an important descriptor of the species, then it would be kind of nice to know uh, uh, just a range of similarity values to that, that ideal combination of slope and aspect, or excuse me, that ideal combination of slope and elevation. So yeah, Mahalanobis actually gives you a continuous response ranging from very low values, meaning that the land is very similar to this ideal combination of values, ranging to very high Mahalanobis distances, meaning it's very dissimilar. Uh, it's a pretty neat uh, variation on environmental envelopes. And just to clarify, uh, Mahalanobis doesn't only work on uh, slope and elevation. It's, it's useful for any numeric variable, and it can apply to any number of numeric variables, it's not just two. So next method is also a really intuitive method, uh, the minimum convex polygons. We're going to use this method to identify potential home ranges of an animal. Now, uh, it, it, it's intuitive because if you think of these point locations on this map as, say, pins in a map, you stretch a rubber band around them, that is the minimum convex polygon. It's called a convex polygon because there are no concave angles in there. All angles on the boundary are convex. And it's called the minimum convex polygon just because it's the smallest such polygon that meets this definition. So a technical term, but a really simple idea. It is what we consider a very conservative approach in that it will always identify any area that an animal uses. You know, it, you know, unless you just have bad data, and you can't get away from that. But presuming you have a good uh, sample of locations, the minimum convex polygon will contain the areas that that animal needs. Downside of it is that it is maybe it, it it's not appropriate in all cases. It's most appropriate when the animal is uniformly distributed throughout that region. But sometimes animals are constrained by other factors on the landscape. This particular example shows a species that really focuses on riparian areas at the bottom of canyons. So it's distributed up at Oak Creek Canyon and up some of the tributaries. Well, if we drew a minimum convex polygon around it, boy, we just get an awful lot of area that the animal clearly never goes to. So we've definitely got the entire area that the animal uses, but we've got a lot more too. So the downside here would be if you tried to use a minimum convex polygon to declare some management uh, area for this animal, and maybe it was a real restrictive one, so say no logging or camping or doing anything in there, well, you'd get a lot of resistance from anybody who wanted to do work up on the rim there, and rightfully so. Clearly the animal doesn't do anything up on the rim, so why would you be preserving that area? So it's it's got this downside. Uh, Otherwise, it, it's really a good method. Um, it's also a very commonly used method. You see uh, minimum convex polygons uh, developed quite often in the literature. Now, this last method, kernel density, uh, it's the most sophisticated approach, and it's the only one really appropriate for determining where an animal prefers to spend its time. As with minimum convex polygons, kernel density method relies entirely on animal locations, does not consider background habitat characteristics at all. 
This means we can use it to find the areas the animal likes to be just by looking at where it is. Then we can examine the habitat components that occur there and, and use that to try and figure out what ha habitat components the animal is selecting for. Now, if you've never heard of kernel density, there's a fair chance you might have heard the term heat map. You know, they're the same thing. They let you see where an animal spends its time. and Even better, they let you rank the importance of any point on the landscape to that animal. Um, you can even draw contours around the density surface. And you know, this is a real step up from the minimum convex polygons, which basically just tell you true or false whether an animal uses the area. Now there's a few downsides to kernel density though. You know, first off, it's not very intuitive, nor is it very easy to explain to a stakeholder. In general, you're probably better off just saying a heat map and hoping that they're familiar with the term. Second, the results are dependent on some parameters that are not easy to estimate. Bandwidth, for example, is notoriously difficult to estimate. Remember that bandwidth is just the radius around each cell that the tool is examining. And I discuss this concept in detail in the Word document, so make sure you read that over. But it's very difficult to guess what the appropriate bandwidth for any particular analysis should be. And presumably the correct bandwidth would depend on the perceptual range of the animal you're studying, but who knows what that is. Spotted owls paying attention to an acre around them or a hundred acres, you know, who knows. Now there's a couple other weaknesses to kernel density as just as, just in the way ArcGIS does it. You know, first, it always uses that same bell-shaped kernel that I showed you in the document. But maybe a bell-shaped maybe just a bell shape in general isn't appropriate for the phenomenon you're mapping. You know, there's there's a lot of research into different types of kernel, different shapes of kernels that are more appropriate for different things. And higher end statistical packages let you modify the shape of the kernel, but ArcGIS doesn't. Now another problem is that the output is always in density terms and that might sound like a plus when you're talking about a kernel density tool, but sometimes density itself isn't really the value we, you want. So for example, um, it, the, it's going to give you values in say number of points per square kilometer. And that's fine if you're only looking at a single set of points, but it means that the kernel density values aren't really comparable between different sets of points. One owl might have a kernel density values that range between 0 and 100. Another owl might have them ranging from 0 to 200, and yet they're both roughly the same size of territory and they have similar movement patterns. It's just a, a, a function of the kernel density that gives you different ranges of values. This means, say, a density value of, say, 50 points per acre. This, this might mean one thing to one owl, but it means a completely different thing to the other owl. And that's just a downside of doing everything in densities. A better method would be to transform the density surface into, say, proportions under the surface. And with this method, you could actually identify where the owl, owl spends, say, 95% of the time or 5% of the time. You get it down to percentage values instead of density values. And once you get it down to these percentage values, then the values are comparable between animals. Now, if any of you would like to use kernel density in whatever projects you're doing, and you like this idea of converting densities to proportions, and please let me know. Dr. Chambers and I have been working on methods to do this in her analysis of New Mexico jumping mice. I think I have a couple of pictures of that in that document. Okay, so much for the quick introduction. So make sure you read over that Word document. It explains all these concepts in a lot better detail than I could in this quick uh, recording. Um, also, as you work on them, keep in mind uh, you know, what, what seems good about the method and what drawbacks do you see with them? Because each of them have good and bad points. Imagine what you would do if you had outlying points or outlying data for any of these methods. Uh, what would be the consequences of that? and How would you adjust your data set to, to not let that outlier skew the results too bad? You know, which methods would be more sensitive to outliers? Also, um, when it comes to um, doing, say, analyses on like a male versus female or nighttime versus daytime or, or seasonal uh, home range patterns, uh, the, way you, the way you make this work is you select points first and then you run the tool. So if you wanted to do all the breeding season kernel density analysis, 
you would select the breeding season points first, then you would calculate the kernel density. And uh, then if you wanted to look at nighttime patterns, you'd just select all the nighttime points and then rerun the kernel density. Uh, in the past, a lot of people have, have gotten confused on this point and think they only need to do one kernel density and then they can somehow extract all the different uh, seasonal and diurnal nocturnal patterns from that one density surface, but that's not really how it works. You have to redo the density surface for each time period. All right, so uh, just launch into those labs. Uh, Jose and I are available through the entire lab period, and you can always email us through the rest of the week, and we'll sure be glad to help. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.